I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at, at CSIS. It's a real uh, pleasure to have Ajay Chibber, who's the Assistant Secretary General for and Assistant Administrator of US, UNDP and Director of UNDP's Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, Mr. Chibber uh, spent 25 years at the World Bank before coming uh, to UNDP and has the primary responsibility for UNDP's work in Afghanistan. Uh, he's going to be uh, He's going to be. He's been asked by his uh, his his country of India to come back to India and to go into public service. So he's been a multilateral public servant for much of his career. But and I think we're very fortunate to have him uh, here today to give us uh, his perspective on the development challenges, but also that frankly the development progress and the development opportunities in Afghanistan. I think too, far too often in Washington, and there's a lot of good reasons to. To be concerned, and there's you know that there are a lot of things to worry about in Afghanistan, but there's been a lot of progress in Afghanistan in the last 10 years. If you look at the number of cell phones, it went from 50,000 in the year 2000 to something like 15 million. Um, you can now make payments electronically on cell phones in Afghanistan. There's been a flourishing of independent media in Afghanistan. A uh, significant amount of, of infrastructure has been built, not complete, but been built. If you look at the the health metrics. Uh, on any number of different metrics. I believe polio, I think, has been eradicated in Afghanistan, uh, it, whereas before it couldn't happen if you look at the any number of different health metrics. Uh, and then if you look at, in my mind, the most important is, is the number of girls in school. I think everyone knows that famously there were zero girls in school in, during the Taliban. There's something now, depending on the day, something around three million girls in school every day in Afghanistan. Now, Okay, granted, there are certain regions of the country where it's tougher uh, for girls to go to school every day, but that's not in every region of the country. Um, there are over 20 uh, provinces in Afghanistan, and not every one of them uh, is, makes it difficult for girls to go to school. This is a tremendous development uh, accomplishment, and it's going to change the society over time. So uh, we're going to talk about, uh, Mr. Chibber is going to share his perspective. We're very fortunate to have UNDP here. UNDP was in Afghanistan during the Taliban period. They are going to be uh, in Afghanistan for the long haul. They are they're there in good times and in bad in countries. And uh, I have a lot of respect for what UNDP does. It's a, an incredible thought leader. They, uh, on any number of different metrics, whether it's the uh, human development report that they put out or the Arab human development report, which I think changed the world, or their growing inclusive markets work, um, they're a very important player in development, and so we're very fortunate to, to have him here. After Mr. Chibber's remarks, I'm going to ask my friend and colleague Andy Cutchins, who runs our Russia and Eurasia program, to talk about um, an initiative. This is in line with this discussion about the progress and the, the challenges, the progress, and the opportunity in Afghanistan, to talk about an idea that um, Andy and a colleague developed several years ago that's, that's taken a lot of, has gotten a lot of momentum around the concept of the new Silk Road and, and the role Afghanistan plays, could play in, in such a new Silk Road. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Chibber to, um, to have the floor. Um, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you for that very warm welcome. And um, I see some old friends and some, I know, of course, a lot of new friends. So uh, it's wonderful to be here with you. And as Dan has already announced that I'm leaving, I guess that means I can speak even more freely than. <laughs> that, that's what we're hoping. <laughs> um, but anyway, first, I think exactly what you said, Dan, which is, you know, the story is always about bombings and conflict and, and death and destruction and security and all that. but. Uh, there is, there are people living, there are things happening on the ground as well as we speak. And part of what we try to do, I don't know if you all managed to get a copy of the development advocate, but my colleagues who work, I cover, you know, 39 countries, so I'm not uh, daily working on Afghanistan, but uh, my colleague uh, Deodat Maharaj is here, who's the division chief for our Afghanistan division. and. He and his uh, uh, colleagues have put this thing together called the Development Advocate, which is to highlight, um, you know, some of the positive development stories um, that are happening, sort of inch by inch, if you like, in Afghanistan under very difficult, of course, security conditions. But there is things happening, and Dan already gave 
uh, a sense of some of those, the, s the children going to schools, the, you know, the, uh, the communications, improvements, etc. And I'll come back to this communication issue a little later because I think we could do uh, a lot more uh, in Afghanistan on that, despite the fact that there's already been quite a lot of uh, progress already. So, um, the, and, and, and as he said also, um, you know, the UN now has this sort of special mandate type of presence uh, with uh, political presence mandated by the Security Council in the form of UNAMA, which is an, which is an integrated UN mission, uh, but that the, and UNDP is part of that, but uh, UNDP has been there well before UNAMA was there and probably will be there uh, well after uh, UNAMA has uh, disbanded. There's no talk of disbanding UNAMA at this point, so don't get me wrong because there's still a lot to be done, but uh, UNDP is basically there for the long haul and therefore focused in a sense on the long haul uh, as well. I thought I would um, start with um, uh, pointing out, of course, some of the uh, challenges that we see uh, up front and, and wherever possible I'll try and interject what UNDP is trying to do to help address some of them. Wherever, the, wherever UNDP is relevant, I will try to do that. I think, um, you know, the, um, one of the things that I think is very important is that in the first stage, since Bonn won, a lot was done to build the sort of institutions in Kabul. And uh, after Bonn two, I think a lot more needs to be done to focus attention away from Kabul and focus much more at the sub-national level. I think this is pretty well known. Now, of course, you have a situation where the transition, you know, with so many different types of transitions that are being described in Afghanistan, one major transition that is underway in addition to the troop withdrawal is that the PRTs, can you put up your hand if you know what a PRT is? Well, a lot of people know what PRTs are, the Provincial Reconstruction Teams. And pretty much uh, all the international uh, donors that were there or, or members of the ISAF, if you like, the international uh, force, picked a province and put up a PRT there or selected a province in which to try their hand at development uh, in addition to uh, uh, trying to provide security and establish these PRTs. And quite frankly, while you may have some visible success with PRTs in the sense that they fixed uh, irrigation system here and there, put up uh, health posts and you know various types of things that they were trying to do. Our assessment is that in the long run, PRTs were actually quite detrimental to the buildup of genuine subnational governance capacity in this country. And not to mention the fact that now that they have to be handed over, uh, the issue is really who to hand it over to. And if you hand it over to a subnational authority that is not capable of managing these assets, then how do you maintain them, how do you service them, and how do you go forward from there? So that's a, a, a major challenge that in a way has been also partially left into the hands of the UN to say, you take over these you, uh, PRTs. And, you know, when initially when this sort of request came to us, we said, we are not going to take over PRTs. We are, you have to hand them over to the Afghan government uh, or whatever authority that exists in the provinces, and we can try and help to see how best they can have the capacity to work with them or have the ability to be able to manage these assets going forward, but it's, it's, not, an, it's not an easy challenge. But I just leave that out there as a major issue that now sort of these, uh, these teams that have left behind have created. 
The second, I think, big challenge is, is, is a fiscal challenge, which is that, you know, the whole structure was so dependent on aid, and the World Bank had already estimated that it was more than 100% of GDP. Um, n but now, if that, uh, that uh, amount of assistance is starting to come down in a post-2014 period, then you have this huge fiscal gap that is staring everybody in the face. And you don't have really the capacity uh, to raise revenues in a manner that would be nowhere able in, 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 in any uh, reasonable manner to be able to fill this kind of a fiscal gap. So how do you then manage your budgetary expenditures? How do you manage uh, to run things in a much more uh, cost-effective manner than has been the case so far, and yet ensure a modicum of services and, and uh, you know, um, facilities that the government is to be able to provide. I think this is a, a huge issue that sits out there as well. And part of it is also that uh, the absorption capacity of that assistance is very weak. Uh, and therefore, um, being able to move even existing amounts of aid through that weak capacity has been uh, a big issue. But let me come back to this one again. I think the third issue that faces this transition and a challenge is that we had such a strong emphasis on security that at the neglect of justice and the rule of law. So you have to think about how we can transition uh, from this huge emphasis on security alone, you know, train the police, train the army, um, pay them, uh, whatever, give, you know, provide them all the facilities, etc. But uh, very little effort on rule of law and on justice, and in some sense giving uh, the Taliban an opportunity to provide the kind of swift justice, if you like, uh, and gain some popularity uh, from that as well. So, I mean, it, it's, it, it's interconnected with the security issues, but you need to address these issues simply because the emphasis on security alone will not be enough. I think the other thing that these three uh, issues that I have just raised have probably been mentioned and discussed, uh, you know, many times, but I repeat them here as well. I think the issue also that staring Afghanistan for the long term in the face is uh, the youth bulge in Afghanistan. I mean, if you look at the population pyramid of Afghanistan, you are going to have a very, very large increase in an age group from 18 to 25. So if you don't have jobs, you have no way of making uh, a, a, li a livelihood or, uh, or a job opportunity for this huge huge youth bulge, then you are opening yourself to a lot of discontent and local uh, insecurity. One factoid that is not well known is that Kabul, the city of Kabul, is the fastest urbanizing city in the world today. So, you know, we think of Afghanistan as probably this huge spread out uh, country, but partly because there's been so much concentration of money in Afghanistan and, and efforts to develop uh, Kabul, and partly it's that there's a lot of, still a lot of insecurity and lack of development outside of Kabul, you have a very large number of people flocking in into Kabul. Uh, and, and also you have uh, returning of refugees into the country so there's a lot of displaced people, vulnerable people. Uh, there's very minimal property rights or services that are being provided to these people and uh, leaving them vulnerable, of course, to huge issues like uh, diseases, et cetera, but also, I think, um, uh, creating 
um, the opportunity for destabilization into the future. So these are the big challenges uh, as we see them and hope that we can play some role in them. For example, on subnational governance, this is a very big area for uh, our work in the country, and some of it, of course, is highlighted in the development advocate uh, as well. The, the work that we have been trying to do with the uh, district, uh, the elected district assemblies, but also at the subnational governance level, that uh, working with the municipalities to try and improve their finances so that they can, uh, and improve their capacity and their finances so that they can deliver better services to the people. But the big debate that is now on in Afghanistan is how do you, uh, how do you uh, devolve in some way? How do you devolve financial power from Kabul? How do you, do you, uh, do you give a block of money to each of the provinces and say, you decide what are your top priorities and how you would like to spend this money? Do you come up with provincial plans, whereas you still have money going from, say, the Ministry of Education to its counterpart at the provincial level and then down into uh, the local and district levels? Or, or do you actually hand over blocks of money to particular provinces and let them uh, develop their priorities and plans as they see fit? And this is obviously a debate that uh, is very important uh, for um, any uh, future uh, you know, mechanism for service delivery. And it's very important for us as well because once uh, the structure of how that devolution will take place is agreed upon, then agencies like UNDP can, of course, um, uh, you know, design their assistance programs more effectively uh, around uh, those issues. But at the moment, subnational governance capacity is very weak. It's very varied also across uh, different parts of the country. And that's why uh, when you think of the Tokyo Agreement in which, um, you know, we, there was a mutual compact of assistance that would be given to Afghanistan in return for which, of course, Afghanistan was required to improve transparency, improve accountability, etc. Uh, the latest estimates are that the implementation rate for that assistance is only at about 40 to 50 percent. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the channels through which this money has to flow through remain uh, very weak. So if you want the Tokyo Mutual Accountability uh, uh, Pact to be uh, effectively implemented, implemented, one of the key areas for that is the capacity at the subnational governments. In addition, of course, um, we have been working uh, very closely with the Ministry of Finance in making aid budgets work. Uh, of course, the Ministry of Finance is as keen as anybody to bring more and more of the aid money through the budget. This is also an issue of tension between, within the government because many of the line ministries are quite happy and quite cozy in the relationships they have with donor agencies, don't want any interference from the Ministry of Finance. Consider that if, it, if the money has to have some flow through through the budget, it will actually slow down the implementation uh, rate even further. But for the long-term future of the country, you cannot have a situation where a, where a very large part of your development budget does not go through the Ministry of Finance. With the money that is coming through UNDP, what we have, I signed an agreement with the Minister of Finance, Minister Zakhilwal, to try and bring most of our, the money that goes through UNDP through the budget, but also have an arrangement where the monitoring, the uh, auditing, of that money will still follow, uh, to some extent, UNDP rules so that we can have accountability to the donor community, but yet be able to have the Ministry of Finance be part of the mechanism of approval of these, fin uh, fin of these monies 
uh, flows into various ministries. Um, the, uh, we are also, of course, uh, working, I mean, the country clearly needs a, a major civil service overhaul. You can't have a situation where in ministry after ministry, every time a minister changes, uh, the minister then brings, uh, you know, 40, 50, 100 political appointees into the ministry as jobs for the, for the boys and girls from wherever province that they are coming from. Uh, and that cannot be the way that you can run an effective civil service in the future. So uh, a kind of civil service reform, a major merit-based recruitment system is needed. As you see in the development advocate, this is being done piecemeal. We have made an attempt at more, I mean, the headline is more merit-based recruitment, right? And you'd say, is that, a, is that a headline to have that you have merit-based recruitment for the first time in a part of the government? I mean, that should be the normal practice uh, in most governments, but it becomes a headline in Afghanistan because it's so new and it's so uh, against the current culture uh, that has persisted in the in the country, but uh, step by step, we we can see that we have that has to become the norm in most ministries, or part of an overall overhaul of the way uh, uh, people are being um, hired and uh, promoted as well. I think the other big issue is that because of these parallel aid systems, you have uh, a dual or a multiple salary structure in Afghanistan. You have uh, people being given top-up salaries to retain the best people, uh, but you ended up with a system where you have you know, uh, such a d uh, numerous uh, sort of uh, salary systems operating at the same time. And this, again, in a period when aid budgets will decline, will mean one of two things. Either these people will walk off and do something else, and some of them already have begun uh, that kind of an exit, or we have to find another way to be able to retain the best of these uh, in a system in which salaries, their top-up salaries will obviously have to be much lower than they have been so, so far. So. Uh, but you could, if not handled well, you could have a sudden collapse of important capacity, uh, critical decision-making capacity in major uh, ministries in the country. And we have to find a way to address some of that. I mentioned earlier the issue of uh, shifting from a focus of security to a greater focus on the rule of law and justice. Um, and uh, this is, uh, uh, as you, some of you may know, we, UNDP helps manage this uh, law and order trust fund, the LOTFA fund. Um, and this fund uh, so far has focused a lot on the security side, it's focused on you know, the payment of police salaries, the verification, uh, induction of, of uh, police women into the police force, their training, etc. cetera. Um, but we do believe that uh, there is an opportunity here to widen this uh, trust fund into a genuine law and order trust fund rather than a trust fund that is basically focused on the police system itself. There has been some efforts in this at things like, you know, community policing, et cetera, but it's, it's quite small at the moment. But I, I think that's the direction in which it needs to go. And in that case, I think the engagement with the Afghan government has to be broadened out of the Ministry of Interior alone and uh, take into account a broader justice and rule of law uh, program in the country. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, Dan, but let me mention that, of course, we are still heavily engaged uh, on uh, 
the immediate tra transition, not just at the long term, but, and one of those issues, of course, that is very big on everybody's mind is the next election in the country. Um, it, it, it would be, in a way, a defining election because uh, it will determine whether, uh, I, I believe, it will determine you know, if it is carried out effectively, it could end up uh, producing the kind of legitimacy to the next government, which is very badly needed if uh, an engagement with the Taliban has to be carried out effectively. I'm, uh, by that, I don't mean just fighting. I mean just even the negotiations have, that has to be a very important part of it. Of course, the effort of the Taliban will be to disrupt that election as much as possible. Uh, the UNDP elect project has a very uh, important project that is now working with the election commission uh, to put an effective, reasonably effective operational system in place uh, so that you can have an election that is, as I said, uh, has a modicum of uh, acceptability, credibility, uh, and legitimacy. And But also our effort is, as we have in many other countries in which we have worked on election issues, is to try and leave behind an election system that is stronger than the one that was there before UNDP was engaged in it. So it's a step, step by step process. For example, we were, have been involved uh, in Indonesia's elections, the first one right after the uh, fall of uh, President Suharto, the UNDP's engagement was very heavy, the second one less heavy, and by the third one, we were almost out of uh, that business. Uh, so, it will take probably longer in Afghanistan, but anyway, our effort is very much to work on that side. Um, and uh, we are, uh, UNDP provides the technical support, the political affairs department of the UN. DPA works on the political side together with UNAMA. Um, and uh, we hope that we have at least in place a better system that we can leave behind for the future. One of the big issues, of course, for us is women's rights uh, and, and women's participation in this election, which is obviously going to be a huge issue. Most of the women's groups feel that they, their rights will be set back um, and their ability to participate in the electoral systems, etc., like we saw in bits of Pakistan recently would also be a huge issue as well. Uh, two more things, I, I, if I could uh, mention. One is that on the agriculture side, this is going to be very important. I mean, if you want to create jobs and uh, income gains and poverty reduction, I think the, the, I mean, a lot has to be done in other areas, but certainly agriculture has to be a very, very critical part of that. Here again, we, we believe that um, you know, there are good programs in place, but there's too much effort on supply, on kind of supply of inputs to the agriculture sector, you know, whether it's irrigation or fertilizer or seeds. I mean, it's a little bit piecemeal, and not enough has been done to look at the entire value chain, as it were, in different agriculture products, in food processing capacities. Uh, so I think some of that a shift in that direction uh, is something that we are, um, we are suggesting as well. Now for the issue of, uh, I mentioned the issue of, uh, you know, the fiscal gap and aid. And, uh, um, I mean, there's an effort to put in a lot of money now, which cannot be easily absorbed, as we are seeing with the 40, 50 percent implementation rate, and the risk that after 2014, there'll be very little money. So you say, if you can't increase the capacity so quickly, uh, and yet you will need money later, then uh, one answer that we have is to set up a trust fund 
uh, or, or, you know, in addition to the existing trust funds that the World Bank has and uh, ADB has, is to think of setting up a trust fund that will be able to, uh, sort of a capacity building trust fund that will be able to keep the funding now in place and be able to disperse it in a way that will increase the capacity which will also improve the implementation rate in the future. Um, so this is something that uh, we are discussing at the moment with donors and with the government of Afghanistan. Um, you know, and it's a, um, it's a way to um, negotiate our way through this transition, the aid transition, so to speak, uh, for the future uh, as well, to have um, a kind of a s service delivery trust fund, a capacity building trust fund that will help in building the capacities um, and also be able to, over a period of time, bring more and more of the monies uh, on, on budget as well. The last issue I want to mention, and in a way this is a segue to, to you as well, is the whole issue of regional cooperation that uh, we believe is very, very critical uh, for a variety of reasons. One is it's critical also for um, you know, uh, the ability of a post-2015 political situation to sustain itself. Uh, and it's very critical also for uh, the kind of um, employment generation, economic regeneration uh, that Afghanistan needs. I, I do believe that the mining issue has been overplayed a bit. I mean, it's gonna take a while for the mining industry to develop in Afghanistan and to be able to bring things in and out of Afghanistan in a cost-effective manner. But that doesn't mean that there's a lot of other trade that cannot be encouraged, particularly on agriculture. And, uh, and uh, of course, the new election in Pakistan is actually, uh, in my mind, a very hopeful uh, and a very positive development uh, because you have now the possibility of a peace agreement between India and Pakistan. And so the traditional markets for Afghanistan, which were always south in a way, the large markets for Afghanistan, those could be easily reopened and could change very much the economic calculus of agriculture production in the country uh, quite significantly. <clears throat> but that also means that the uh, regional uh, cooperation, regional integration with uh, countries to the north of Pakistan is also, of course, uh, very, very important. And uh, we had helped, UNDP had helped establish um, a, uh, a unit in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs focused to build their capacity, because so far, um, regional cooperation in Pakistan was talked about by everybody else except, you know, they, but there was no capacity in Afghanistan to assess what is their interest, what are their uh, priorities, etc. <coughs> so we, we started working on that. <coughs> but I think this will be important for any post-2014 transition as well. And may I stop here, Dan, and thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ajay. I'm going to ask my friend and colleague Andy Cutchins to, to talk about uh, the new Silk Road within the context of what we've just heard. Uh, Dan, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about the uh, New Silk Road. Uh, and it's a special honor to share the, the podium with uh, Ajay uh, Chiber, uh, the UNDP. Um, this is a topic that I used to talk about uh, quite a bit two or, th two or three years ago, and I'm a little bit less practiced right now, but I had, there were a couple of caveats I always had to make before I would speak about it. One, you know, I'm not an expert on Afghanistan. Uh, I'm a trained, a Soviet, trained Sovietologist. I would joke, well, what are you doing with that? Working in Afghanistan, Andy? I would say, well, you know, I just found working with the Russians so difficult, I thought I'd do something easier, <laughs> fix Afghanistan. Um, <clears throat> uh, secondly, I'm really not, I'm not, I'm not an expert on, uh, on development at all. 
Uh, and so uh, with those caveats, let me explain a little bit uh, kind of how I, how I came, came to this, uh, how we, our team here and with some others came, came to these ideas, um, because in some ways we were the intellectual godfathers uh, for what has taken on a, a policy life of its own, and it's, it's uh, not an, an experience that uh, one actually has that often uh, in, in think tanks when this, this kind of happens. And uh, I'm kind of proud about this one. But it was very serendipitous, like, um, because, as I said, given my, given my background. In 2007, shortly after I came to uh, CSIS, uh, a colleague of mine, I don't know whether you've got this handout, this one, this one page, uh, Steve Benson, he was a retired uh, naval logistician, came to my office. I didn't know who he was. I was like, you know, what the hell is he bringing me this for? What, what is this? And so Steve explained what it was. And basically, this was uh, 1999. It was a, uh, a satellite shot of... Uh, uh, telecommunications taking a place ac across the globe. And you can see here in the northern hemisphere where it's black, uh, that means there's a lot going on. Now this can reflect economic activity, can reflect con construction activity, can reflect military activity. It reflects what we sort of just called it was human, act human activity. And this is the northern corridor of modern, uh, modern activity here in the northern hemisphere. Now if you'll notice, there's one spot where it's real, very uh, lightly colored. It's very disconnected from the rest. Well, that happens to be in the area of Central Asia and Af Afghanistan. Probably the epicenter would be on the, the Tajik, the Tajik uh, uh, Afghan, Afghan border. Now, this was a very powerful uh, uh, graphic to me, and I'll tell you why. Because if even then we knew in 2007, if we'd taken another snapshot, we would see quite a bit more black dots in what we called then the modern activity gap. And this was symbolic of a very large uh, phenomenon taking place that we've called the reconnection of Eurasia. Uh, and it's primarily economically driven. And you've got to remember that during the Cold War, your largest powers on the Eurasian continent, to a great extent, were not really engaged in a lot of trade and transit activity, that being the Soviet Union, that being the People's Republic of China, and even, and even India. Things began to change substantially, of course, when the Chinese began to reform in the late 1970s. The Soviet Union collapses in 1991, the borders come down, middle 1990s, India begins to reform, and suddenly the economic forces and drivers from these countries are exerting powerful forces, uh, and they're looking to connect with Europe, they're looking to connect with each other, looking to connect with the greater Middle East, etc., and that's what's driving, I think, a lot of what is this, of this reconnection in, uh, of, of Eurasia. And transcontinental trade is growing dramatically. Now, most of it is shipped by sea, but increasingly more of it was being done by, done by land. Uh, and the, the interests of large states were intersecting at this, at this gap. Now, the gap states themselves, those that were sort of somewhat disconnected, you know, they suffered from a number of pathologies, relatively relative poverty, uh, corruption, poor governance, uh, the growing role of Islam, increasing uh, role of radical Islamic groups, um, nearby proliferation of nuclear states, ethnic conflict, terrorist activities, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the pathologies you associate with instability, and it comes essentially from the disconnectedness. So this reconnection we saw is a, is a major strategic change that was taking place that was, frankly, much larger than Afghanistan. We didn't think of it in terms of at the time of Afghanistan. And we thought of a project we were going to call Visualizing Eurasia, which was essentially to map out how this change was taking place and how the interests of various players were shifting and changing as a result. Well, that kind of language for a while didn't really go anywhere. Suddenly, in, uh, in 2009, my uh, colleague here uh, at uh, CSIS, Arno de Borgrov, who runs the uh, Transnational Threat Program, he had dinner with General Petraeus in January of 2009, just after General Petraeus had returned from Central Asia and was starting to develop the agreements that would lead to the, the establishment of new transit corridors for the supply of non-lethal goods via commercial routes to support our troops in Afghanistan. Now, I didn't know jack about logistics at the time either, but I quickly found out that about oh, close to 90% of what supports our troops in Afghanistan or anywhere else are non-lethal goods, and they're typically uh, transited by, by, uh, by commercial carriers. And they were looking to open up new routes that went through Central Asia, that went through the Caspian, and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. That's an interesting proposition. And the reason they were doing this, because of the ex expectation of the much larger military footprint we would have, increased demand for, for those goods, plus 
you wanted to have, uh, we were at the time entirely dependent upon one, what the military calls ground lock of communication from the port of Karachi uh, through, uh, across the Af uh, Afghan, uh, Pakistani border at the Torkham and Chaman Gates. All the material, all the non-lethal material was going, going that way. And uh, the demand was going to increase, and plus you wanted a more competitive situation so you weren't over leveraged by Pakistani trucking industry, port operators, et cetera. That's what, uh, that's what generated this. And when this project came to us, I said, wow, this, in, this gives us a hook into what he sees as this, uh, this reconnection of, uh, of, uh, of Eurasia, so to, so to speak. And so as we began to study the, uh, the issue, what we found out quite uh, counterintuitively is that the biggest problem to getting things in and out of, in and out of Afghanistan, a logistical challenge that General Petraeus I think described uh, as trying to supply almost the only thing more difficult on the planet would be trying to supply Antarctica. Uh, it was not the lack of physical infrastructure, although that was a problem, railroads, roads, et cetera. It was also not the, uh, the security problems, although that was a problem, but it was not the main problem. The biggest problem in getting things in and out of Afghanistan on a, on a commercial basis was uh, what I've described as basically borders acting as toll booths bureaucratic, institutional barriers, corruption, uh, <clears throat> which would make it very unpredictable uh, both the time that a, a good would get from A to B as well as the cost of good getting to A and B. That was also a rather counter, uh, counterintuitive um, finding, and it led us to start thinking about, uh, well, when we were working on this in the fall of 2009, there was the big debate about Afghanistan policy going on in Washington. And I was amazed at what seemed how narrow the debate was, because it really boiled down to counterinsurgency versus counterterrorism, AFPAC versus PAC-AF. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Chibber said, uh, you know, there was, echoing what you're saying, there was so much emphasis, emphasis on security uh, that there wasn't that much thinking about, you know, justice and governance issues, and there was even less thinking about, uh, at least in this town, about economic uh, strategies for recovery for the long term. And what passed for economic strategies were really just nice wish lists. There was no sense of prioritization, implementation, et cetera, that came, that came with them. And that was just kind of amazing to me. I mean, you know, again, like I don't know anything about, uh, uh, about, uh, about sort of development in, in, in conflict and post-conflict situations. But, you know, if you're not thinking about the longer-term prosperity of this, of this place, then, you know, whatever gains are made on, the, on security are likely going to be lost. And secondly, if you're thinking about, you know, Afghanistan in, a, in a, quite a narrow geographical fashion, uh, not really thinking about the other four states that uh, cover its borders, not, not only them, but also the other major states in the region besides, besides Pakistan, you're also, I think, missing, missing the boat. And so the debate in this, in this country at that time, it kind of boiled down to, to the extent that there was an, a debate about economic development, it was sort of minerals or agriculture. Okay, well look, you know, it's not going to be A or B. It's going to be both, both A and B. But if you're not thinking about actually how these goods are getting to markets, then they don't have value. And so what's, what's the point of it all? And this is where we thought that this focus on trade and transit is a strategic enabler for all economic development, not only within Afghanistan, but also with its, with its regional partners, was essential. You had to have a regional economic cooperation plan because that would help for the, the partners to have some kind of economic thus, and thus political buy-in to greater stability and prosperity within Afghanistan. That was the idea. And at the, at the time, the people that were thinking about this uh, in the government, ironically, were mostly located in DOD and in CENTCOM, and we kind of, we kind of hooked up, and we produced this uh, report in May, in to May of 2010 called, with the modest title of The Key to Success in Afghanistan, A Modern Silk Road Strategy. Um, you know, ignorance is bliss, so. Uh, but it was endorsed by General Petraeus. It was endorsed by, uh, by President Karzai. Uh, it plugged into, you know, something that the Afghans, Afghans have been con con continuously talking about since their first Afghan national development strategy back in, back in 2000, 2005. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it, it was this concept which really was the leading uh, 
uh, idea that President Karzai presented in July 2010 at the, uh, the Kabul conference, the so-called Heart of Asia, his Heart of Asia speech. It's really basically about, about this. Now, we thought this would be attractive to the U.S. leadership because, you know, the biggest challenge, it's a political challenge. It's not so much, you know, the investment in the infrastructure, although that's important and, and uh, has to be dealt with, um, but it's political leadership which is going to try to bring together these various interests to endorse a common plan. Um, and that's been very, very hard to come by. But we thought that could be something that would be attractive to the United States. We thought it could be attractive to, uh, to our European allies, uh, who are even more rapidly becoming tired of the, uh, of the security engagement in Afghanistan. And ultimately, it is the private sector which is going to drive this process. Um, but the, uh, but the need for the art articulation of the idea, it had to come from the, from the president, the president of the United States. That's what this whole report was about. And we even drew up a national security memorandum from the president about what needed to be done. So when the president says something, then you get, uh, you're more likely to have uh, bureaucracies working uh, in tandem together because this is the ultimate whole of government challenge and public-private partnership as well. All right, well, let me just conclude by saying what's, what's happened? Well, the good news is that the State Department took leadership, and this was evidenced by Hillary Clinton's speech in Chennai, India, in July of 2011. And there have been many very talented, dedicated, bright, really hardworking people that have been working their tails off for the past uh, nearly two years to try to make this happen. But there are a lot of problems, as one would expect, with a, a big challenge like this. And one of it is, the first piece is that, you know, the president, our president, has not said anything about it. And I think that's a really, that's really unfortunate because that, uh, that sends a message not only to our, our bureaucracy and our government here, but to the governments in the region as well. Secondly, most of the attention that the, the president has gotten is for his December 2010 speech about the withdrawal in 20, 2014. And that uh, uh, has created the impression that basically the United States is heading for the exits. Um, thirdly, even when uh, Secretary Clinton gave the speech, it was only as a vision. Um, it's not a strategy, it's not a plan. Now, I understand there, there's a real political sensitivities and that you can't have the strategy or, or plan that emerges from the U.S. of A. It's got to be an Afghan strategy that has the buy-in and endorsement of its regional, regional partners. But again, when we call it a vision, it uh, doesn't help, I think, the political pros prospects here. Fourthly, you know, um, I mean, there is just an international miasma of groupings and institutes, institutions and endeavors uh, in this sort of new Silk Road uh, vision. There's the six plans of the Istanbul process. There's the 25 Delhi, Delhi Investment Summit efforts. There's the 17 RECA, the Regional Economic Cooperation Council of Afghanistan. Uh, projects and policy priorities. There's the 12 CARIC, the Central Asian uh, <coughs> Regional Economic Council projects, etc. There's a fair amount going on, but it's not prioritized. It's not. It's not coordinated, and so I think the sum is far less, or uh, the whole is much less than the sum of its parts. So, just my last statement: Why should President Obama get his teeth into this now? Well, I still think it is the right thing to do uh, for Afghanistan and to uh, uh, get Afghanistan right. But so far, that argument doesn't seem to be uh, enough. So let me offer another one. I think we need to think about the incorporation of the new Silk Road vision strategy plan or whatever in tandem with the so-called pivot to Asia. Okay, if the pivot to Asia Let's face it, it may not be politically correct to say so, but it's basically about the management of the rise of China. Um, but in typical American fashion, we're thinking about Asia as simply East Asia, from Northeast Asia to Southeast Asia, only to China's West. Well, I can tell you, when China thinks about Asia, they think about Asia very differently. And they think about what's north, and they think about what's west, and they think about what's, what's southwest. Uh, let me just give you one quote to, to leave you with from uh, an article in October of this year by one of China's leading uh, geostrategic thinkers, uh, Wang Jizi, at uh, Peking University. 
He says, the title is Marching Westwards, the Rebalancing of China's Geostrategy. Quote, the Obama administration has recently proposed a rebalancing strategy centered around the idea of a return to Asia. Following changes in the global economic and political structure, Russia, India, and the EU, and other major global players have also adjusted their geostrategies. This new round of geopolitical and geoeconomic competition between the great powers is becoming increasingly intense. Presently, the focus of U.S. strategy is shifting eastwards, while the EU, India, Russia, and other countries are beginning to look eastwards. Located at the center of the Asia-Pacific region, China should not limit its sights to its own coasts and borders or to traditional competitors and partners, but should make strategic plans to look westwards and march westwards. Now, China is going to be the biggest, already is and will continue to be the biggest economic player in Central Asia uh, and, Af and Afghanistan. And we need to think more carefully in a strategic way about how we work together uh, with the Chinese in this capacity, and not only the Chinese, uh, but uh, Indians, Pakistanis, and other regional partners as well. And we shouldn't be uh, essentially throwing away the baby with the bathwater uh, as we make our withdrawal from, of our military forces from Afghanistan in 2014. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. We've got time for uh, a handful of questions. We're going to do this World Bank style. So I'm going to ask people to raise their hand, and I'm going to capture uh, a handful of questions. The gentleman up here, up front, and we're going to do this. We're going to take three, uh, three questions. So this gentleman here, uh, this gentleman, the uniform gentleman here, and then let's get some, uh, anybody else? Other, other hands, please. Anyone else? I do want to make sure there's uh, the, uh, well, I was hoping for a little gender balance here. We got Okay, and those women back there, okay? So these are going to be the three questions. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, my name is uh, I.J. Singh, a uh, former World Bank staff member, but also a professor at uh, the National War College. So I know a lot about PRTs, many of my students being there. I enjoyed very much uh, what Mr. Jay Chibber had to say. Uh, I got hackles down my neck uh, when I heard uh, what Mr. Hutchins has to say. There's nothing wrong with the Silk Road, what is certainly wrong with the idea that the U.S. should manage all this. If you go to the region, you'll find that the regional partners have not even worked on SARC. If you remember, SARC has been there for a long, long time. And they're not going to work, as you correctly state, until they uh, you know, take care of their own accords. And I don't see peace coming because if the Northern Alliance people are left out, there might be another 20 years of war in Afghanistan. But if you went and talked to the Indians or the Pakistanis or even the Afghanistanis, the last thing they want is the U.S. planning the Silk Road. Okay. Gentlemen over here. And I'm going to ask both my colleagues to respond. To different. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. Andrew Turner from the U.K. Uh, Mr. Chibber, thank you very much for your, your um, presentation and points. I just wonder whether um, there is a discerning aim within the U.N. to secure strategic persistence across all of the various donor community whilst we go through this, the security transition and how in real terms you see um, Afghanistan in let's say 2025 because money has been sustained and the fiscal gap has been avoided. Hi, my name is Carly. I'm from Global Witness. Um, Mr. Chibber, you mentioned that the mining issue is a bit overplayed. I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit more. Andy, why don't I start with you, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, good question or, or, or comment. Um, the, uh, I mean, I would be the first to say that uh, the planning of the Silk Road uh, cannot be a U.S.-led endeavor. Um, but I also don't think that uh, the Silk Road is going to uh, uh, and I feel very strongly about this, recreate itself uh, as quickly or as effectively without the United States involvement. Um, and again, because the, the, bi the biggest problem being uh, in facilitating connectivity being the, uh, related to the nature of most of the governments that uh, constitute the Silk Road that they're basically patrimonial regimes that, re, that uh, uh, are, rely on 
of patronage politics, uh, and the funds uh, uh, that are collected and distributed in border regions, um, you know, are are more. The first priority is maintenance of regime stability. I think rather than rather than you know broader national interest and uh, um, and prosperity of uh, of people. And uh, without um, more focus being brought on that, and I think it's something that the United States can do reasonably well. And the other problem being that uh, the region suffers from enormous distrust amongst each other and historical rivalries, uh, that perhaps the United States could have some value uh, in the role of kind of an honest broker. Now, that's a great stretch, and that's probably raising even more hackles on your neck. <laughs> but, can can uh, you raise hackles on the neck? And, sorry, sorry. I don't know. But, um, uh, you know, like I said, it's a, I think, it's, I think it's, kind of, it's kind of a political catch-22. Catch um, you know, I don't, I don't think it happens as effectively, as quickly as, uh, as you want without uh, some kind of significant uh, U.S. leadership role, but it has to be, you know, a very muted leadership role and one which is done in concert uh, and really led, uh, at least in the context of the uh, uh, of Afghanistan, from the Afga Afghan government itself. Okay, Ajay, let me. I'm hoping you can comment on all three of the uh, both questions and comments. If you would please. Okay, thank you. I'll try to be quick. Uh, thank you for those questions. I, I mean, I, I think yeah, you. I mean, the best times in Afghanistan have been when it has been the as President Karzai said, the roundabout uh, in the region. I mean, if you go back to very long history, um, and if any of you saw that exhibition of uh, Afghan uh, treasure that was saved during the Taliban, that probably came through Washington, I saw it in New York. Um, you know, you can see that it was the crossroads of, of China, India, and the Near East uh, in the past. So. If you can get recreate that, that's probably important. I mean, perhaps the new the word new Silk Road and or the U.S. involvement. I don't know which one may have raised some issues, but the idea itself is is not bad. And I think uh, now with the possibility of the Pakistan, uh, uh, you know, part of that Sark arrangement opening up, then of course uh, I do think that regional cooperation will be. Now, the downside of it is exactly what IJ says, that if there is, if there is a split and the Northern Alliance, um, you know, bifurcates, so to speak, then of course, you know, it's uh, all up in the air. The uh, issue on the long term, 2025, of course, you know, it's, uh, you want a scenario, a hopeful scenario <laughs> in which uh, the progress that Dan described in the beginning so far can be preserved. And the preservation of that will require, you know, establishment of national systems. Uh, you know, as we talk about, you know, uh, a nationally owned development strategy uh, to which the international community in various forms uh, will, um, you know, um, support rather than a strategy that is determined by each, <laughs> each donor or each group of donors as they see their interests. And uh, it's not going to be easy, of course, in Afghanistan to have that. And we, we, we all are well aware of that. But our effort is very much, the UN effort is to say, what would be the building blocks of budgetary systems of uh, you know, trust fund arrangements of um, capacity that would be needed not just in Kabul to build a national plan, but at the state and local levels to be able to implement that easily as well. And uh, it's not going to be an easy process, but that's, I think, the kind of arrangement that we need at least for the future. And uh, one thing I didn't mention that while, of course, we are very happy that there have been uh, 14, uh, 14 million people with cell phones and all that, and 
you know, I met, last time I was there in January, I met with the information minister um, and uh, raised with him the possibility that um, what we've seen in other countries like Bangladesh is how do you digitally connect the different provincial cap uh, headquarters, the district headquarters, to each other and to Kabul? Because these days, as you know, a lot of services can be provided digitally. And uh, given the terrain of Afghanistan, given the logistics difficulties of moving things around Afghanistan, to my mind, I mean, that, that is a use of technology that we have not seen so far. So he, he has informed me that they are now working on the fiber optic cable, and if, if that arc is completed, then they will be able to play with that. That is a platform from which medical services, educational services, basic, uh, you know, uh, training, um, recordation, et cetera, can be done. Now, we've just helped the government of Bangladesh finish all this in Bangladesh. So it is possible, and we are arranging a visit from Afghanistan to Bangladesh so that they can see. Oh, the, the terrain is very different, I understand, but the idea is an interesting one and I think quite useful for Afghanistan for the future. Uh, I'm not down on mining. I think the potential is huge. It's just that, um, you know, it's going to take a lot of uh, time and effort to get to a point where you can actually see some results from it. And for the immediate, and I agree also that you need to work on all fronts. Um, in fact, one of the other ideas I've pushed uh, in Afghanistan is a kind of cash for work program, which is for this period of transition when Im investment, people will still be holding back, not being uncertain of the political climate, then um, <clears throat> perhaps, uh, and with this youth bulge numbers that I talked about, perhaps some you know cash for work programs for maintenance of roads, for reforestation, for um, you know, um, helping with uh, critical uh, needs in the country could be a way to have people show up daily to get a wage. Uh, and you want to see them and you want to check them out because otherwise they're with the other side, you know. So it's an idea which uh, we have also discussed a little bit. It hasn't got as much traction from this government as I would like, but uh, because they say we want genuine private sector uh, employment. But I tell them that you want to get the private sector employment, but till you get there, what about all these unemployed people and what do you do with them? And, uh, you know, so that's another idea. Anyway, thank you. I think, I think our time has ended. Please join me in uh, thanking uh, Ajay and Andrew. Thank you.